Joining me now is Dr. Bruce Vanderhoff. He's the Chief Medical Officer for the Ohio Department of Health. And Dr. Vanderhoff, I wanna start with vaccine distribution. What is it going to take to significantly ramp up vaccination efforts? I understand we need more doses, but realistically, when do you expect this could happen? Well, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> vaccine availability is our primary issue. Um, you know, we're looking at the national picture and uh, looking expectantly towards uh, an increase in vaccine. I think that uh, having another manufacturer come online is going to be an, a very important element to increasing uh, vaccine availability. And then of course, once we have four um, of the vaccines in the marketplace, I think we'll be in a substantially better position. It's also my understanding that the current manufacturers um, have been working uh, to increase their production and availability here in the United States. So, you know, at a high level, that's what I think we're looking at. Um, for the present, uh, limited vaccine availability is the issue in terms of uh, challenging our ability to uh, vaccinate more Ohioans. And then based on what we know, how effective are the vaccines that we're putting in people right now against these variants that are out there? And what's what worries you most, I guess, about these variants? Well, I'll tell you, uh, we have uh, considerably good news there as it relates to these vaccines and these uh, variants. Uh, first, uh, something that I, I think is very encouraging is the fact that we've known uh, since these uh, vaccines were first approved that they are exceptionally effective. Uh, it, to have vaccines that have demonstrated in clinical trials uh, efficacy in the neighborhood of 95% uh, is almost unheard of. So <clears throat> we're dealing with first of all, vaccine product that is robust. The second thing to consider as we're thinking about these variants is that the current vaccines have a design that was almost ideally suited to dealing with a variant environment in that they were designed with access to the virus's genome and were designed very specifically to attack the business end of the virus, which is its spike protein. So that even though we have some changes occurring in the spike protein, the design of these vaccines is such that they are creating antibody that is able to cope with multiple changes uh, uh, in that spike protein. And the analogy that I've heard, and I think is an exceptionally good one, is it, they produce essentially what's more like a piece of Velcro uh, that even if you were to imagine the virus changing such that you removed se sections of the Velcro, you can still see the Velcro sticking and sticking fairly well. Most recently, uh, we've had um, good reports coming from both Pfizer and now from Moderna that have validated that there is a very good uh, coverage, very good uh, response with Moderna and Pfizer against the UK variant, the so-called uh, B117 variant. Uh, and now uh, a laboratory model showing um, that uh, even against the much uh, feared South African variant, uh, the Moderna vaccine, which is very similar to the Pfizer vaccine, um, <clears throat> has demonstrated that um, it uh, protects uh, even against uh, that variant. So good news on that front, but not entirely surprising given the structural design uh, that I outlined. Take us through the year ahead, if you can. Are we looking at a steady easing of restrictions here? Or are we gonna be stuck in limbo indefinitely? What do you see come spring, summer, fall, and winter? Well, a lot depends on the rate at which uh, Ohioans take up the vaccine. Uh, the closer and closer that we get to being able to achieve herd immunity, which is enough people in the population uh, that as a population, we're just not a welcoming environment for this vaccine <clears throat> to keep setting up house. 
Um, the closer and closer we get to that, the um, closer we get to uh, a re restoration of our lives without having to constantly be playing defense uh, against the virus. And, I, and that means that we can, when we get there, really foresee uh, uh, life much more like we used to know it uh, without having to rely upon um, our masking, social distancing um, uh, efforts. Now, hopefully, hopefully, we don't entirely forget those because um, the essential les lessons they've taught us have proven to be incredibly impactful for flu. You know, we're not seeing flu at all uh, this year. Wouldn't it be great if next year, because we remember, hey, I've got to keep my hands clean. I have to cover my cough. I have to um, not get so close to people. We continue to see flu be uh, a minor uh, uh, episode. But So I, I would really be looking toward when will Ohio uh, achieve a um, reliable level of herd immunity. And do you see that happening this year? I think it is possible. Uh, of course, a lot remains uh, yet to be seen in terms of vaccine availability and response. But um, I've heard uh, many uh, national authorities, people who are very knowledgeable about vaccines and this virus, um, point towards that being achievable uh, over the course of uh, the coming months. Uh, now, uh, I don't want anyone to have in their mind a, you know, a false sense of guarantee about that, but I would like them to have a sense of hope that uh, if we all continue to move forward and, and we continue to see uh, the high level of interest uh, in vaccine that we're seeing now, uh, I, I think that it, we can have optimism that that's achievable. Yeah, hope is a, is a very uh, big thing right now. I think could could really go a long way for a lot of people. Uh, here in the in the in the near future, beginning February fifteenth, people with some severe health conditions can get the vaccine. When will the state release guidelines on how they should go about verifying their condition? We've gotten a lot of questions about that. You know, those are good questions to be asking. You know, one, before I answer that, because it's important context, I want to emphasize the fact that our primary tactic, our primary objective is an age-based one because um, age is hands down the best predictor of risk of mortality from this vaccine. We talked about 65 plus representing 87% of our mortality. You know, if we drop that down to 50 plus, um, just for theoretical considerations, that accounts for about 98 to 99% of our mortality. So this virus clearly from a mortality point of view um, is tightly linked to age. Uh, now that's not to mean that people younger um, can't uh, get sick enough to die. We have seen people who sadly um, have gotten this virus, really didn't have much in the way of risk factors and yet have gotten sick enough uh, that they have died from the vaccine. So nobody's off the hook. Um, also doesn't account for the many younger people who uh, will go through a period of getting significantly ill. Um, but let's now think about uh, the folks who we, we've identified uh, in our medical risk category for 1B. And this uh, a group of individuals um, we have approached in a two-phased approach, much like we did with our 65 plus group. You'll recall with those, we began with those who uh, were in congregate care environments, especially our nursing homes, um, because they were the highest risk of that group. Well, with this group, we began with those who are um, recognized as having developmental or intellectual disabilities, because again, the data was very clear. That was the highest risk even within this group. For the rest of the group, um, uh, we are actively working now on how uh, uh, providing the guidance uh, that they'll need when it uh, comes time to go to vaccination sites. Um, uh, it, and uh, I just ask them to please stay tuned. I can understand their eagerness uh, to have that, but we're working closely not only with healthcare providers, but also um, uh, uh, people who work closely uh, with each of these medical populations um, uh, to get uh, insight into what will be most workable. 
how is the effort going in terms of, of reaching out to the minority community uh, to encourage them to get the vaccine? I remember Governor DeWine uh, talking at least about a month ago about that there would be this outreach effort. Um, we haven't seen anything yet. I don't know if it is out there or not, but uh, just wanted to get your opinion on how that is going and if we're going to see something soon if we haven't already. Well, that effort uh, is underway and um, um, has been actually um, since we began rolling out vaccines. But we recognize that um, if we want to achieve a better outcome than we have achieved with uh, some other healthcare issues in the state, uh, uh, as it relates to issues of uh, inclusion and, um, and diversity, we have to take a different approach uh, than, than we've taken historically. And we've, we've known that. So we've begun with um, a lot of listening and asking, reaching out to leaders uh, in the African-American community for uh, feedback and guidance regarding uh, what can be helpful. And we're following that up with uh, engaging uh, leaders, especially from uh, our faith communities uh, in um, uh, providing them with information and education so that they can be our partners as advocates uh, for vaccination. You know, one of the challenges that we simply have to recognize that we have to overcome with these new vaccines is that uh, the United States has had a checkered history as it is related to vaccine safety, especially uh, as it relates to the African-American community. Now, in the development of these vaccines, I'm very proud of the approach that was undertaken really for the first time uh, in, um, vaccine history, there was intentionality around the inclusion in uh, vaccine trials of a balanced approach to uh, both ethnicity as well as age uh, and other demographies. So uh, these are really the, this, these vaccines represent the most thoughtful approach I've seen to date on those issues. Now we have to share that message because there's um, fear and we have to work with people to um, uh, dispel that fear. The other piece that is important around this, though, is getting the vaccines available, providing delivery access where the African American community resides. And uh, we've been working with local health departments and public health authorities, as well as community leaders, to uh, increase access through um, uh, avenues that are that are in the geographies in the neighborhoods. Um, where um, many of our African-American um, citizens live. So those are some of the efforts today. Uh, we are um, looking for uh, the numbers that, that we see to improve. And, uh, 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 you know, I, for one, am watching those numbers very closely, and I'm not going to be satisfied until we're seeing a uh, parity uh, uh, in those numbers. Is there a media campaign at all, or is this more behind the scenes? No, there's also uh, work being done uh, with the media uh, to get that message out, and particularly uh, getting it out to um, the uh, African American and other underrepresented minority communities, uh, including, I might add, um, messaging for some of the communities uh, in their primary languages, because we, we do have underrepresented communities uh, for whom uh, English is not. Uh, their primary language, and we want to be uh, respectful of that. We've been talking a lot about vaccine. Obviously, that's what's going on right now with the distribution there. But uh, testing, what is your opinion of the home tests? And if they're accurate, who are they best for? And in what situation would it be best to use one of those? Well, thank you. You know, both testing and contact tracing continue to be very important. And Ohio has not only not backed away from this as we are leaning into the challenge of vaccination. We, we've invested more. Um, so when it comes to testing, people may be aware of uh, the recent announcement uh, that the Ohio Department of Health has invested in more antigen testing uh, to get that out to more Ohioans uh, and to improve, therefore, people's knowledge uh, about uh, their potential situation as it relates to COVID-19 uh, uh, exposure and or positivity. Uh, we feel very, very good about the antigen tests that are currently available. You know, we had a bit of a dust up uh, back in August when our own governor uh, had um, 
uh, uh, antigen tests that had false positives. Um, we didn't know very much about the uh, tests at that time in terms of false positives, false negatives. We know a great deal now. We know that false positives are incredibly rare and that in fact, a positive test with uh, one of these antigen tests, um, the, the true positive rate is really very similar to what we see with the gold standard, which are the PCR tests that take much longer to run. So uh, we believe that these, PCR, these uh, antigen tests are <clears throat> an important part of the fight against COVID and that they're gonna be particularly useful uh, in certain settings, including group settings, um, including um, helping schools and uh, sports teams uh, who uh, need to be doing regular surveillance. Uh, and eventually um, we, we imagine that these will uh, become even available uh, to people uh, for purchase over the counter. We're not there yet, but I see that evolution uh, coming. But the at-home tests that you can get from Walmart, do we know much about those yet? Yes, we do, and they're very good. And uh, what we're um, really pleased to see is that those tests are also coming with um, instructional guidance, instructional support, uh, including in most circumstances, online uh, capabilities so that uh, a person using them uh, can uh, get a little bit of handholding uh, with something that uh, may be very unfamiliar to them. Is there a certain person who should use that test or is that for, for anyone? Is there any certain situation where someone should maybe go get that test as opposed to another test or maybe there's not a test available? So the one caution that I would um, give anyone who's thinking about an antigen test is this. If you get an antigen test and it's positive, you can go to the bank with that. It's a positive antigen test is you're positive. However, you shouldn't overinterpret getting a negative result. A negative result on that test is not a clean bill of health. It does not mean, okay, I am good to go and to you know, stop my masking and distancing because there is a um, much higher rate of false negatives with those tests. Um, that's, that's sort of the price that is, we pay for them being quicker, easier, more available. Well, they give you great information about if I'm positive, okay, I can count on that. Not so much with the negative. So they're good for screening. I think they are a really, really good tool, particularly if we're going to screen a group of people on a regular basis. Um, if an individual wants to use the test um, to evaluate their symptoms and, oh, you know, I'm positive, well, I better go. But again, if it's negative, they're gonna have to continue um, acting as though they might be positive uh, and may have to repeat that test uh, another day or um, uh, think about going and getting a PCR test. Got it, good point. Should a COVID survivor wait to get the vaccine? How long do antibodies live in the body? So this is a great question and it comes up understandably quite a bit. Here's the best guidance that uh, we're able to provide at this time. Um, when we get uh, antibodies from our exposure to the illness, from having COVID-19, we sure do mount a response. And we know from watching uh, people that we can rely on pretty good immunity for a period of months, certainly for about three to four months. Because we, when we're exposed to it in, in the wild, in nature, um, our responses can be very variable how long we can count on that immunity is much less predictable. The wonderful thing about the vaccines is we're getting a set predetermined, very well studied uh, uh, amount of vaccine that produces a pretty reliable result. So our, our advice is even if you've had it, we still recommend you get vaccinated, but uh, with a couple of caveats. One is don't get vaccinated until you're out of isolation, so you're certainly past 10 days, and you're recovered. You're back to your baseline. You feel like yourself again. Then you can consider getting vaccinated. However, because you also know that you've got pretty good natural immunity for a few months, 
you might want to consider, especially at a time when vaccines are in short supply, waiting to get your vaccine until you're closer to that time running out. Now, if you want, if, if you decide, you know what, no, I'm recovered, I'm out of isolation, and I think it's best for me to get it right now, you can. Uh, but you can also wait till closer to three months. Excellent, thank you, doctor. Last question. We're about a year into this pandemic now. What more do we know about any lasting effects of the coronavirus? Well, we're still learning, unfortunately. Um, it's a brand new uh, virus. Uh, we've known it a very short period of time. And we do know that some people who uh, suffer from COVID-19 do have lasting effects. And this is another of the reasons why all of us should give very serious consideration, regardless of our age, to getting vaccinated when it's our time. We, we have seen that individuals um, who get COVID-19, um, while they may recover, may continue to have some lasting symptoms from that. And there, there's a high degree of variability about uh, what they experience, ranging from some things that can be pretty serious, like, for example, we've seen some people who will develop something called a cardiomyopathy from it. And we've seen this with other viruses where their heart muscles may actually get um, impacted to other things that are more of a nuisance, but nevertheless unpleasant, like, for example, losing some substantial amount of taste and smell uh, for a long period of time and everything in between. So. Uh, th this virus, you know, we, we shouldn't think if we're less than a certain age, well, you know what, it's going to be like a cold and I'm going to ignore it. No, this is something to take more seriously. And if you can get a vaccine, I, I'd strongly encourage you considering getting it. And then do you think that we'll have to get a vaccine every single year? Well, the jury's out on that, but my prediction is no. Um, I think that uh, the indications that we're seeing about how the immune system responds, at least to these first two vaccines, is that it's a very robust response. And it includes some things that I look for, like not just the development of antibodies, but also the development of cellular responses that indicate a high likelihood of lasting immunity. Now, being able to declare definitively that lasting immunity results takes time, right? And we haven't had that time. But scientifically, uh, my seeing that there's the, those key cellular immune responses is very encouraging because that's what we see when we see long lasting immunity. All right, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on it. And I know a lot of people would probably be pretty enthused if they only had to get this shot one time. <laughs> yes, indeed. Dr. Bruce Vanderhoff, Chief Medical Officer for the Ohio Department of Health. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet with you.